or on computer. Great. Okay. So just as an intro for those of you who are new to the Snohomish County Transportation Coalition or SnowTrack, um, we advocate for connecting people and communities in Snohomish County and beyond with safe, equitable, and accessible transportation. Um, we are a mobility management coalition funded through federal dollars. And so uh, our main role is convening human service and transportation providers and planners to address mobility gaps for people with special uh, transportation needs because of disability, uh, age, uh, veteran status, uh, having Medicaid, um, uh, being a tribal member, and so on. So our panelists today are Hester Serbren from Transportation Choices Coalition, Policy Director, um, Russ Arnold, Chief Passenger Experience and Innovation Officer at Sound Transit, and Justin Layton of Washington State Transit Association. Um, all who have been working on different aspects of, this, of these issues, uh, in very meaningful ways. So I'm excited about the, the breadth of different topics that we can bring and also the, the advocate perspective to the uh, agency perspective on these issues. Um, I'd like to start um, by just providing a quick overview of the current state of affairs uh, rela relating to fares. Um, so in recent years, there has been a growing call for eliminating fares altogether from public transit as a means of increasing access to low income individuals. Um, now, there's several agencies in the state, or at least a few agencies in the state who are already fare free, including Island Transit, who connects into Everett Station, um, and Intercity Transit down in Thurston County in Olympia which just went fair free a couple of years ago, thanks to a ballot measure that provided funding. And they thought uh, they could either go to ORCA um, or they could go fair free and it was cheaper to go fair free. So they piloted it and kept it. Here in Snohomish County, uh, Snow Goose Transit, um, which just launched in January, is fair free with the donation option. Um, and uh, we have, I believe, yes, we have Amy Biggs here on the line and one of her services is also a similar fare free with donation, although others do have fares. Um, so, and then I think as we all know, during the peak of the pandemic at the very beginning during lockdown, all of our trans agencies weren't fare free as to avoid any contact with drivers um, and just contact in general. Um, this spring, and Justin's gonna to touch on this, uh, the Washington legislature uh, authorized more than $1.4 billion for transit agencies uh, subject to the transit agencies making their systems fare free for those who are 18 and under. Uh, so this is definitely something that's moving forward. Um, the other aspect for our discussion today is on enforcement. So uh, it's, it's one thing to have fares and it's another to actually enforce the fares. And the Black Lives uh, Movement, Lives Matter Movement in 2020 really brought a lot of advocacy to the idea that we should be rethinking enforcement and how it's done. Um, and so with stakeholder input, both King County Metro and Sound Transit have been um, leading efforts to rethink how they do enforcement. So I'm excited to have Russ here to talk about what Sound Transit has been doing. Um, uh, they call them fair ambassadors. I call them fair fairies uh, in terms of their shift of enforcement. And that's why we have our title today. Uh, is what it is. Um, there's one more thing which we won't go into too much because uh, it is a matter of litigation, um, but uh, community transit's enforcement um, of its fares on SWIFT is subject to a lawsuit right now that's before the state Supreme Court uh, of having uniform officers on, a, on the bus uh, and whether a uniform officer can interact with somebody once they're on the bus. And so that also raises this issue, which we will not get into today. Uh, I don't think unless a panelist is interested in bringing it up. Um, in terms of what our affairs are right now, let's see if I can switch screens here. In the county, um, we have uh, fares of, uh, I'm just showing community transit fares. So you get a, a grounding of what people are paying here. Uh, the local service in SWIFT is 250. 
um, with youth fair at $1.75. Uh, and then there are reduced uh, uh, fair options for those who are low income through the Orca Lift program. Um, so, and then for Everett Transit, we have $2 for adults, uh, $1.50 for the low income fare, the Orca Lift program, and for the youth program. And seniors and disabled are at 50 cents a trip. So it gives a sense of where we're at for the county, uh, in addition to the nonprofit transportation providers like Snow Goose Transit, yeah, Snoqualmie Valley Transportation. So with that, uh, I'm gonna kick it over to our panelists. Um, we're gonna go first with Hester and then with Russ and Sound Transit and then Justin to um, highlight the, the youth fair provision of the, the state transportation package. So Hester, uh, go ahead and share your screen. Great, thank you, Brock. Thank you uh, so much for having us on this awesome panel. Can you see my screen okay? And just the portion I want you to see. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so, uh, hi everybody. Uh, I know some of you I saw in the participant list, but not others. And really excited to have a chance to talk to you and with you about this important topic. Um, my name is Hester Sarabrin. I use she/her pronouns, and I am the policy director at Transportation Choices Coalition. Uh, we're a statewide nonprofit focused on getting folks safe, equitable, and sustainable transportation options. And I think I really want to root us in a vision that I assume is is shared by most of the folks on this on this Zoom, which is um, safe, affordable, and easy to use transit systems. And um, I know that a lot of the focus of today's conversation is on fares, um, but I actually want to root us in the larger context of those 2020 racial reckonings and how uh, policing and enforcement. Uh, can show up in transportation and can create real harm, especially for uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color populations. So over the past two years, TCC has really expanded this area of work, and I'm um, proud and here to share and talk about it. So uh, why are we here? Um, there's a great, great quote from Brenton Mock City Lab that says, the Jane Jacobian idea of eyes on the street very easily becomes eyes on the Black people which is why some African-Americans disengage from public spaces like parks altogether. These peaceful green spaces just as easily induce anxiety and trauma for black and brown people, especially when they know cops can be unleashed at any moment. And as we all know, uh, transit and almost every other form of uh, transportation is a public space that people use to connect um, with each other and get where they're going. Um, I probably don't have to tell most of you that uh, Black and Indigenous people suffer disproportionate police violence. Uh, these community members are significantly more likely than white people to be killed by police. Latino men are more likely to be killed by police than white men. For young men of color, police use of force is also among the leading causes of death. And policing in transportation specifically can lead to injury and death for black and brown community members. Traffic stops are the most common interaction that people have with law enforcement. Uh, policing in transportation can provide opportunities for discriminatory or pretextual targeting of civilians. And across all modes, locally and across the nation, jaywalking, failure to show proof of payment, broken taillights, and other minor transportation infractions have provided justification for police involvement that ended in civilian death. Even when a racially profiled traffic stop or interaction doesn't result in violence, it can create fear, humiliation, and PTSD for these community members moving through public space. Saeed Joaquin, Sandra Bland, Dijon Kizzy, Byron Lee Williams, Samuel DeBose, Oscar Perez Giron. These folks were all killed after being stopped for routine traffic enforcement. So we also know that black and brown folks disproportionately receive transportation related tickets. Uh, I have a few stats here uh, by mode that I won't go through, but the trend is the same. Um, citations usually overwhelmingly are given to uh, black users of the system, whereas the overall percentage of black and brown users of the system is much smaller. And in addition to that, uh, beyond the citation process, within the citation process, uh, punitive fines and fees and other consequences are more punitive towards uh, 
black and brown and native american community members um, so just want to talk a little bit about the additional types of harm whether they're mobility or financial you know if you fail to resolve a traffic ticket or enforcement fair enforcement ticket in court you may receive a late fee uh, your ticket may be sent to collections your vehicle may be impounded and your license may be suspended and then driving with a suspended license is a crime um, additionally attending court to address a fine can put undocumented residents at risk of deportation one of our key allies in this work has been groups like northwest immigrants project um, immigrants rights project that has at least one and probably more instances of folks who have gone to pay a, a ticket for fair enforcement and have been uh, targeted by ICE who waits outside the courthouse. Um, and we also know that transportation enforcement is expensive and punitive fines aren't working. Um, I know a lot of this has changed by now and so Russ is here to talk about kind of new systems that are underway, but pre-pandemic Sound Transit spent about 1.4 million a year in fair enforcement, doesn't get those money from fines, which are handled by the court and a majority of tickets, at least pre-COVID were unpaid and were sent to collections. So uh, transportation choices, I have a link that I'll put in the chat later because I'm sure I'll mess up my screen if I don't. Um, we have a document that talks about how we're approaching uh, enforcement and policing and transportation and some of the approaches that we think um, are better suited towards getting people uh, the resources that they need and it's around decriminalizing behaviors that encourage sustainable modes. So we helped support um, some of our local partners work on repealing the King County helmet law. Um, we'll be looking at uh, repealing some jaywalking laws, knowing that often they are used for pretextual stops, uh, especially for modes that we're trying to get people to be to use and feel comfortable in. Um, redirecting police budgets into upstream solutions and community benefits prioritize incentives, education, engineering, and access over enforcement. Um, replacing armed officers with civilian officials or automated enforcement to reduce the chance of uh, violence between police and civilians. Remove courts, as I mentioned, um, or remove the administrative process from the courts for tickets. Offer opportunities to correct matters before penalties are issued. Uh, thinking about progressive fine structures based on income and really making sure fine revenues are reoriented back into community solutions that help prevent, um, prevent these issues and help folks make it easier for folks to use these systems safely and to comply. Um, and so just a little bit about our work on fares and enforcement in transit. Um, I won't talk much about Sound Transit because Russ will cover that, but um, we have been working with, with partners, uh, advocate partners and partners at the agency to help support programs like Orca Lift, uh, the subsidized low income fare. We'll be talking more obviously about youth fares in the coming months and regional coordination among all the, all the agencies in the Orca area. Um, in the enforcement policy, again, we've been working with community and agency partners on better community engagement, data collection and equity analysis. And then um, knowing that this policy is up for a vote at Sound Transit next month, uh, really pushing for support of a lot of the proposal elements that are before the board. Um, in addition, lowering fines, helping people connect with resources and um, supporting the FAIR Ambassador uh, program. Uh, King County Metro, as Brock mentioned, um, this process started a few years earlier uh, as the result of an audit from the King County Auditor's Office that showed the disproportionality that um, the data shows almost everywhere you look in terms of uh, who is receiving fines and it was people of color and people experiencing homelessness and so the general manager there uh rob gannon at the time brought us in and was like what do we need to do and it was a really great opportunity to work with leadership on what a less an ideally non-punitive system looks like and they brought brought it out from the courts and in-house um, and really focused on getting people signed up for orca lift um, having having built relationships between the officers and folks that maybe re, repeat, um, I don't want to say offenders, but people who are, are continually unable to pay and really helping um, get those folks what they need. Uh, they are also working on a second round of uh, reform called the Safety, Security, and Fair Enforcement Reform that um, County Executive um, Dow Constantine has, has been pushing for, which is looking beyond fair enforcement, but uh, issues of security, 
policing and safety on the bus for drivers, riders, and um, figuring out kind of best methods that work for everyone. And then um, at the state legislature, we've done a couple of things to help uh, pilot automated enforcement to understand the equity impacts of that. Um, House Bill 1301 has, I think, uh, enabled sound transit to, to move forward on some additional options by um, uh, not no longer requiring that things have to be a civil infraction that go through the courts, um, working to support the bill from Senator Wynn on removing police from routine traffic stops, and um, again, as you'll hear from Justin, the work on Move Ahead Washington to help uh, incentivize youth fair free fair programs. So uh, I know a lot of you uh, work in jurisdictions or at transit agencies, so just want to kind of offer some questions for reflection um, as a takeaway from this presentation. What is your vision for rider experience? How do fares and enforcement fit with that or not? How would you consider equity in your fare and enforcement policies? What current practices do you have um, that are focused on punitive measures and which are focused on connecting people with the resources that they need? Who is helped or hurt most by these policies? And what data do you have or need to evaluate fair and enforcement policies for these, um, for these criteria? So that's all I have. Thank you so much for having me. Fantastic, Hester. Thank you. Um, we'll do question Q and A at the, the end here. If you do have um, specific, you know, questions around facts or or certain things, feel free to ask them. So that way we don't lose you along the way. But we're going to jump right in to Russ. And Russ, I think you probably have a presentation to share on the screen. So uh, feel free to do that. Sorry, one second, I'm uh, finding. Uh, can you see this? Yeah. Okay, thanks. So uh, I'm Russ Arnold, I'm the Chief Passenger Experience Officer, Chief Passenger Experience and Innovation Officer at Sound Transit. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. And uh, I'm gonna walk through this today. I forget, uh, I've been working on reimagining fair enforcement for about three and a half years now at Sound Transit. So sometimes I forget that uh, everybody hasn't heard this because I feel like maybe I've said it a million times. So um, okay to stop me. And as Mark mentioned, questions later, uh, you can uh, definitely catch up there if it makes sense. So uh, first of all, I want to share with you the vision that has been guiding this work for the last three and a half years a system where everybody taps, where everyone who has fair media can get to where they want to go, and everyone who needs fair media can get access to it. Um, so the, this has been the vision statement that's been guiding us through this. Um, we've been trying to center on equity and fairness to our writers, stakeholders, community members, and taxpayers. Uh, sound financial stewardship, as indicated by high fair compliance, meeting fair box recovery targets, um, uphold sound transit's values of passenger focus, integrity, and inclusion and respect, as well as safety, and then continuous improvement that is measurable and accountable, um, because we know uh, that this has been an evolving process, and the more we learn, the, the better we get. So as mentioned, there are some actions coming up um, here fairly shortly next week. Uh, seven days from today. So at the exec council, uh, exec committee next uh, on April 7th, uh, there will be put forth the fair policy that I'll walk through with you today. There's also a suite of other recommendations outside of just the compliance policy um, that we feel are important to consider as we look at this in a more holistic way to support passengers. So we want to establish a permanent uh, fair ambassador program. Currently, it's a pilot program that's only funded through August or innovation program. And uh, the board has to formalize this ambassador program and we have to do a budget amendment for it. Lower Orca lift fare to a dollar. We also had a recommendation to uh, synchronize youth fare to a dollar as well and do more outreach with Olympia and partners to see how we can support youth. Obviously, uh, we have good news on that. So we're not bringing that up here because there's a different work stream that's uh, looking to bring back that recommendation to the board so they can take action. Increase our budget to uh, by about $400,000 uh, specifically to engage with uh, 
hard to reach and engage communities. We're going to do some research, figure out what the best messaging is, channels, what kind of, what is the right mix between uh, marketing and outreach and engagement to ensure we're really um, getting the message about opportunities, Orca Lift, uh, the low income um, program uh, to people that need it most. Um, and then uh, continue our participation in um, the very low to no uh, income program that King County administers. Uh, we initially, I believe um, the board indicated a two-year pilot period. Uh, we want to extend that and continue to be participants in it. Uh, so the latter ones, uh, just the structure of things, uh, go to our Writer Experience and Operations Committee uh, for action, and the policy goes to our Executive Committee. Both are on the 7th, uh, one's before lunch and one's after lunch. Um, so just to give you a kind of very high level of what we've done over the past three and a half years, we've talked to um, quite a lot of people. We've heard a lot uh, about um, what they want from fair enforcement, how they think it should be evolved, um, what are what's important for us to consider. Um, so, you know, you can see lots of surveys, some, some sounding board, which is an online um, voice of the customer program that we do every single month, deep dive on issues uh, and writers, our passengers give us feedback on. Uh, we've had listening sessions, virtual and in-person town halls. And then we did another survey in 2021. Um, we developed an action plan. And then we also have learned experience from our fair ambassador program because it's in the pilot phase. So we've been uh, learning and evolving since it really went in about about uh, mid-August. So just uh, this came up during our fairs workshop recently uh, as we kind of show this. And so what you're seeing here is overall ridership and then non-paying riders because our uh, non-fair boardings, uh, which is a a global look of how many people are paying and or not paying when they ride the system. Fair compliance is a subset of that. That is basically the percentage of interactions from ambassadors, previously fair enforcement officers. Um, so the two numbers tell us kind of a little different things, but I wanted to share this with you. So you can see um, pre-pandemic uh, Connect 2020 is in there because during that time we were not um, really enforcing fares as much because of the complication of transfers at um, um, Pioneer Square. Um, and then COVID, that's the fare suspension that you see there. And then there's a period of there that says no fare confirmation. And that's uh, very intentional because fare enforcement officers, as they used to be, were still in the system asking for people to visually show them idea that they had paid. Um, so that looked like uh, normal interaction with fare enforcement, except for they would say, can you show me your ORCA card? Um, as Brock mentioned earlier, you know, suspending interaction for the health of everybody. Uh, so they would hold up an ORCA card. Card. We, we didn't know if they tapped or not, um, and there were no warnings or anything, but the, the mechanism by which we did um, enforcement prior was still in place. And then you can see there about mid-August is when the ambassador program came in. This was when the fair enforcement officers were no longer used at all, and the ambassador pilot uh, started. Uh, and I would mention that uh, the board had directed... Um, at right around the time of the pandemic to suspend our current policy. So we have a policy in place, it's the old one, but it is suspended per direction of the board. Uh, so we're not using it currently. And, and technically uh, enforcing no policy or asking for compliance to no policy um, until we adopt a new policy or the board adopts a new policy. So recommendations. So first of all, uh, I wanna point out, so we've, um, there's suspension, not to include and no law enforcement role in fair compliance. Um, passengers without proof of payment, they may can continue to ride. This is different than how it was uh, before. If you did not have proof of payment, you were asked to leave the train at the next stop. And then passengers may dispute any moment in the process uh, because um, we're bringing it almost entirely in-house or that's the recommendation. So program comparison, just kind of at a high clip before uh, the old program was a warning, uh, one warning in a 12 month period, and then civil infractions after that. And uh, that was $124 monetary civil infraction that could only be um, uh, handled through the courts. And so what we've, we're recommending, and we'll get in more detail on this, is a two warning system in a 12 month period. 
The third will be an internal resolution, and there are different options that, that, that come about for the third and fourth interaction. And then the fifth interaction and beyond um, would still be the civil infraction uh, ability um, would still be in place. So this is the current recommendation not adopted by the board yet. So I want to walk through just uh, some specific here uh, because we don't yet have a good solution here and I want to be uh, transparent about how this works. So if fair ambassador uh, gets on asks you for proof of payment you show valid proof of payment. We, you know, great have a great day see if we can answer any questions for you um, and you continue to go about your day. The fair enforcement gets on and ask um, or a fair ambassador sorry uh, changing language sometimes hard. Um, and they ask you for proof of payment and they request a, you don't have it and they request proof of ID and they're refused, there's nothing that uh, happens after that. Uh, we have no ability to verify identification. That was the interaction point with uh, the sheriff's office. They have the ability if someone does not have any proof of identification on them to identify who the person is. So since we've removed that, uh, we do have a moment here that we don't have a great solution for where if you do not have um, fair payment and you do not have ID or unwilling to uh, show ID, uh, it kind of ends the interaction. Uh, but if you don't have proof of payment and you do provide your ID, um, they'll document that and then they'll let you know what phase you're at in the documentation a warning phase uh, or one of the others that we previously uh, talked about. So uh, what are those resolution options look like? So third and fourth interaction. So if you have a third interaction, you've had two warnings uh, and now you have a third interaction of uh, not uh, tapping and, and having proof of payment, um, you can resolve that internally with sound transit in a couple of ways. There's a, a ST engagement. So that is a focus group engagement that you can participate in or an education activity. Think about when you have to uh, watch a video for defensive driving because of a traffic violation or something like that. Uh, you can load $50 on your ORCA card and then you can continue to use that to ride. Uh, you can pay a fine of $50 or on the third time only, you can sign a commitment to tap in the future. And this, uh, uh, essentially works as a third warning, uh, allowing people to say that they commit to continue to tap. And then they would, if they uh, have a fourth interaction in 12 months and have not tapped again, and they have a, on file a commitment to tap, they'd be asked to resolve uh, both the third and fourth interaction at the same time. So that could look like they um, take an education activity and do an engagement opportunity that would resolve both the third and fourth interaction. On the fourth interaction, there are all the same um, opportunities for resolution, as well as what currently being uh, proposed as a $75 uh, ticket. Um, and then if no action is taken in 90 days on the fourth interaction only. So uh, third interaction, uh, you don't engage with us, you don't take any action to resolve in any way that we've offered up, um, kind of nothing really happens. Um, on the fourth interaction, uh, if the same uh, behavior persists, uh, we would have the ability to send someone to collection, um, though this would be identified through the internal resolution process. It doesn't mean we have to, it means that we retain the ability to. And then uh, if you're a reduced fare uh, passenger, all the same um, options apply. Um, so then the repeat non-payment proposal is the fifth interaction we would in a 12 month period and beyond would uh, go to district court. So this is not a criminal referral, it's a civil infraction. So think about a red light speeding ticket or parking ticket. Uh, this allows the agency a tool for any patches that continue to not pay, uh, that do not fall in the previous categories of support. I should mention that we didn't call out here that there is another work stream in my department. Uh, we're standing up uh, what is called the Deputy Director of Passenger Success. And so this person is um, going to be responsible for connecting extra resources for those passengers that we engage with that need more support. So if, uh, because this is all internal, if say at the first warning you have, it's clear that you need more support in getting a, a ticket so that you can tap, um, you know, think about that one of the things we want you to be mobile uh, if you need help getting um, payment options we want to make sure you get that help 
we would kind of move the person into a different bucket for of support. Uh, we don't want to continue anybody down the path of warning one, two, three, and four. If it's clear when we interact with them that they're going to struggle at any point in the future with that, we want to engage early in that and get them the resources they need so they can keep writing. I didn't call that out. That's probably a incredibly important point that uh, I have to update the PowerPoint on. Sorry. And so, uh, you know, we've been talking about, uh, you know, metrics, KPIs to make sure this is working, some questions that we're using to guide to, to see this. Uh, and we want to come back quarterly to the Writer Experience Operations Committee because we believe tracking this is going to be important. This isn't just uh, do a policy and then forget about it. We want to be very intentional about, is it working? Uh, I point out to people, people ask me if it works now, since there is no compliance policy in place, you can't um, measure if the compliance is um, being affected by this new program. We can measure if we have uh, been better at responding to the equity questions and the being more passenger focused, which uh, the input that we get from passengers who do interact with the ambassadors seem to indicate that yes, this is a more equitable way. There's a lot of support for them. Um, we actually have connected a lot of people up who needed Orca Lift um, to Metro to get signed up, which we're very happy about. Um, so we do feel that portion is going well. We still need to measure the rest once it goes in. So this is a program equitable and not harming communities. Who are we not reaching and how can we reach them? That goes back to the budget uh, amendment for research and enhanced marketing communication. Is fair compliance effective without an ID requirement? Uh, what is the effect of this policy on fair revenue and our long range financial plan? If you've watched before the current projections with a couple different factors in terms of uh, fair rates, uh, as well as parking some other things, look like the, that if the current compliance rate of about 40% of people continue not to pay, uh, over the 20 year uh, span of the financial plan, it looks like it puts about a $6 billion hole in the total financial plan. Uh, so we want to monitor that and make sure it's healthy because we're still responsible for delivering uh, what the voters have asked us to deliver in terms of sense of expansion and the daily service that is required to support people in this region. And then are the fair ambassadors helping create a positive, safe, and passenger-focused experience for riders? We, 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 we believe in that and we want to make sure that um, that's happening. So these are some of the questions we're using to develop metrics to measure this that we'll bring back to the board quarterly or we're recommending to bring back to the board, board quarterly. And then this is a high level snapshot. This was at our fairs workshop uh, last month and the little uh, magenta box is where we are at right now um, of things that need to do this specific to compliance, but we're trying to get um, we're trying to think about all the things that affect passengers um, in a more holistic standpoint and not take these as individual actions because um, obviously compliance um, relates to T-line fares that we need to set, uh, uh, you know, relates to authorized daily paid parking, um, the youth fair approach, what are the stride fares going to be? And these are all decisions the board have to make relatively soon in the next 18 months. And we want to make sure there's a holistic understanding of how each decision affects the other. And with that, I am done with the PowerPoint. Perfect. Thank you, Russ. Um, We'll jump to, to Justin and get a perspective on the new state transportation package and what it means for fares. Sure. Um, thank you all. I didn't really have a fun visual aid like everybody else, so I've been sitting here preparing one really quick, so hopefully it looks okay. Um, I used to be a high school teacher, so maybe that was bad on me to not have a nice visual aid for everyone, but um, I have a couple. I have one slide that it's going to give an overview that I'll share. Um, and then actually kind of a, a couple of spreadsheets and give you some example on funding levels. But first of all, as a lot of us may have read in a lot of reports, I know TCC has done a really good job outputting and we at WISTA and I know Brock has utilized a lot of that information and probably we pushed it out to you all as well. But we have passed a $17 billion transportation revenue package after six years of talking about it, we finally have one. And what's really important is um, this transportation package it's transformative for um, multimodal projects. To put this into perspective of why we use the word transformative, historical, things like that, Connecting Washington actually only provided about 6% of the total funding package of that 15 billion to multimodal, 4% um, to transit directly and the rest to walking, biking um, and trails. 
This package is a little over 25% to multimodal, about almost 19% to public transportation, and then the remaining to uh, walking, biking trails and complete streets. So really it's a huge paradigm shift about how policy moves forward. And we really owe that, um, that change in the legislature to our two chairmen, Jake Fye um, and chairman Marco Elias in the Senate. Um, both have been champions of walking, biking, riding. Um, Chair Fye actually used to sit on the Sound Transit Board, used to sit on the Pierce Transit Board. Um, and so their whole perspective about how we move people and goods through our community is changing. And that is very much reflected in the package. Of that $17 billion, $3 billion of it comes to public transportation through several different grant programs that are already established and creation of two new grant or a couple of new grant programs. Three new grant programs are created, tribal transit um, grants, a bus and bus facility grant program. If you're a nerd, you know that the federal government does a bus and bus facility grant program. We at WISA have been pushing for a state version of that. They created that. And then what I'm gonna talk to you about is the transit support grant program. Um, I'm not calling it the zero fare grant program because that's not what it's called. It's called the transit support grant program. And we should be trying to use as much as possible terminology like zero fare. Fare free, using the word free, really turns off particularly a lot of policymakers. And so we really try to use the word zero fare. Um, even in inner city transit, they start using the term prepaid fare. The, the voters of the, of the system have prepaid their fares through um, their sales tax and revenues that they get. So uh, the transit support grant, and I'll share just a, a slide, and it basically it's just like what it is. There's a lot to still understand there. Um, it's, as kind of mentioned, it's a little under $1.5 billion over 16 years. Um, and what that kind of computes down to is once the biennium start flowing, we anticipate it to be funded at about $180 million a biennium. In the supplemental cycle, they did start it kind of like maybe some startup money to kick it off with about 33 million for the for the funding cycle and i'll show you some charts of what that looks like for every transit agency um, that we that we think um, i should note that the 180 million is what we estimate or what we are expected it's still unclear of the how even um, the carbon money the cca money will flow into the state we don't know if it'll be up and down, or if it'll be a slow trajectory up. And I think that that has a lot to do with my funding levels in the grant program. Um, so uh, that's what we should be expecting. That's a lot of money in one biennium just for one grant program. Um, to put that into perspective, the special needs grant program um, that is a, a large, uh, large and the most funded program is um, right now at only 62 million a biennium. Um, and so we'll get a lot more money there. So this is uh, the largest grant program that the state has ever created for public transportation. Um, the distribution will be formulized based off of um, a proportion of operating expenses reported in the most recent public trans transportation summary. It's a large document, it gets done every year. It's usually done around September or uh, December. And it basically is all the audited information that transit agency does. That's where you can find cost per passenger, service at cost per service hour, how many passengers somebody or an agency provided on different modes. It talks about the revenues that are generated by the agency for each agency. And also uh, does tribal transits and it also does nonprofit transportation providers. So um, in there, in the back there, it outlines a table and you can kind of sift through it and pull together what that um, operating expenses would look like um, reported, reported there. And the charts that I'm gonna give you are 2019 data. There's a hesitation in the transit industry, not just in Washington, but also across the country to use 2020 data. I don't think I need to say it out loud, but I will. 2020 was a dumpster fire of a year and nobody wants to use any type of data of that year because it just doesn't relate to anything that we've ever done and there's no point in trying to set standards and goals and expectation and performance off of a year that was a dumpster fire. So uh, that's how it will be proportioned out. There's a 35% cap on funding availability. Really the only agency that's going to hit that cap is King County Metro.
And then Sound Transit's not eligible, but that's really by virtue of they're not eligible for state grants in general. That's a part of a different um, version or it's in part of a different part of state law um, or the budget. And so that's just kind of, I wanted to put that in there because a lot of folks talk about that Sound Transit funding. Then there's what makes an agency eligible for it. And this is where we get into that zero fare policy um, for, um, for 18 and under. So it's transit agencies, public transportation agencies as defined by RCW. Um, agencies, as we've talked about, has to establish a fare policy um, that gives 18 years and younger zero fare on all modes by October 1st of 2022. I wanna make sure I point out the 18 years and younger. A lot of people are saying under 18. We've seen it in some advocacy newsletters, even WashDOT in their every other week um, email that they send out to stakeholders said 18 or under 18. If you are 18 years old, 364 days old, you have zero fare. So it's really under 19. So I wanna make sure we are very clear, this is uh, 18 years and under, and those who are listening and doing producing and um, advocating about it and talking about it, it's, it's that. Um, if you miss the deadline by October 1st, you're not eligible for the grant program until the next funding biennium. So really this is an incentive to kind of get, get to that uh, deadline there um, from that point of view. Uh, there's a provision in there that says you must either maintain or increase your sales tax authority that was established on, on January 1st, 2022. This really stems to there's a couple of transit agencies in the, in the state. Their boards are talking about reducing their sales tax because they think they're so flush with sales tax, they should give it back. I think a lot of people forget um, what the recession did. Um, right now, we're living on a, on a mountain and there will be a valley one day and we've got to kind of even out our sales tax over time, thinking about and planning for that time. I started my transit career um, in the height of the recession. We were literally laying off hundreds of drivers and operators and cutting 35% service of the agency we were doing at. And so the, that is because sales tax is high and low. And right now because of federal government and sales tax is really high, we're on a high, and so a lot of agency, not a lot, a couple of agencies are like, oh, we should just give it back, um, which is terrible. So there's that policy in there. And then one of the pieces that I think a lot of people are not forgetting, but not really realizing is a measure that is not that it's hard, but we have to really think about it, which is all of the Climate Commitment Act money is tied to supporting overburdened communities. Um, people who are in poverty, proximity to tribal governments, um, density of those who are traditionally overburdened communities and uh, people of color. And so um, an agency must meet specific criteria to support overburdened communities. This is blanket language that's in all CCA money. It's not just transit money. It's anything, the ferry money, the, if there's bike ped money, those have to meet that criteria. Um, and that work needs to be developed by WashDOT of what that criteria actually is. There's some language in there about what it is, but how do you meet that and what establishes and what thresholds there are, that is actually being worked on now um, um, through WashDOT. And because it is across the WashDOT or kind of the state agency realm, it's not just public transportation divisions that will work on it, they all kind of have to work on it. So they're starting to work, do that effort now. This to me is probably a lot harder to talk about and establish for an agency than the policy of 18 years and under um, thing. And then this sounds kind of silly, but ridership under the program must be tracked and reported to the legislature. That's actually really cool, but it's really hard to do. So we saw in the chat, there's some agencies that are kind of walk on, walk off, fair, um, uh, no fair um, programs. They don't track ridership by are you a senior? Are you a youth? They don't have a tap card that they could track that way. They just have a counter. There's actually an AVA counter that once you cross the, enter the bus, it counts you. So there's got to be some way that we can work up some formula that will establish the average youth ridership, and that can be the number that we use. Um, it's, it'll be a large burden on our operators to have to verify youth. Um, we don't want that um, it's a large burden to just sit there and literally 
count what they think might be a youth. So um, that'll be a difficult um, situation for drivers and that we don't really wanna put our drivers in as well. A lot of agencies are thinking about one, if you're in the ORCA system, that's a lot easier to kind of establish behind the scenes, a youth 18 years and under youth fair and make sure that people are verified. Other agencies do have TAPs and they're trying to work with their school districts to begin to figure out how we can establish a youth fair card. It's zero, but it's like a youth fair and it's verified from that point of view. We also don't want drivers and our frontline employees trying to determine whether you're 18 or 19. Like that's just not the goal here. So we've got to work through those barriers on that point of view. So before um, I finish here, I wanted to kind of show, um, I want to show two charts. I want to show what we expect the first chunk of money on this biennium would do if every single agency participated. All of this is based on if every single agency participated. I'm not guaranteeing that every single agency will participate, but this is what the $33 million would do per agency um, starting in, in this supplemental biennium. Um, so as you can see, King County Metro, for example, um, they are the 900 pound gorilla um, in the room. They're somewhere around the fifth or seventh largest state or agency in the country. Um, so they clearly have um, the ridership and the growth there, but kind of, kind of seeing what this looks like, um, the biennium ends June 30th of 2023. Um, so this is really short, short amount of money there um, from that point. So this is all based on 2019 data as a, as a reminder. And then I'll show you what we expect the number to look like once it's fully funded and if every single agency participated. Again, that is a big, um, big one. So what you see here, and I'll give some numbers, Brock was like, oh, a table of how much agencies get from the youth fair. And then what it means is like, not all agencies collect youth fair. We don't collect that information. For example, uh, Whatcom Transit already has a policy of 17 and under. So they just need to adjust their policy to add one more year um, on there. So it's a little bit all over the map. The other thing is, um, a lot of youth fairs today are paid for by the school district, not youth today. So there's a whole kind of thing about working with the schools on this one as well. So this is Snohomish County to point it out. Uh, we estimate that if every single transit agency participated and we use 2019 money, that uh, every year, this is per year, not by any, by the way, per year, um, that community transit would get somewhere around $12 million um, a year. Um, I forget, I think at one time Rick Elgenbridge told me how much um, revenue is, is from the youth. Um, I know Mary is on, um, is on here, but you know, to kind of put that in the spectrum. I do have some examples. Spokane Transit gets about a million dollars a year from their youth fair. They're gonna get a little over 6 million. So to put it in a perspective that there is quite the counter, there's quite the incentive to do this. It's not a one for one dollar share. Uh, King County Metro, I believe they estimated somewhere around $10 million a year from youth fair. They're going to get $31 million um, from it. So um, it's, it's, it's enough to cover what you would lose and then quite a bit more from that point of view. So anyways, that's, uh, I'll leave it there and I, hopefully I covered everything. There's still a lot to be, undone, like, to be done here. Um, WISTA has set up a special committee of our association every single agency is participating with WASHDOT so we can essentially walk in step with them as they create the grant program because it's gonna be a lot to understand. That's fantastic, Justin. That was really great. Uh, thank you, Russ. Uh, that was yours and Hester's, all great presentations and tons of information. Um, I'm gonna start off with just a couple of um, just informational questions. And then I thought Hester posed a good um, big picture question uh, in her last slide that I wanted to maybe raise. And uh, there are, there's also some informational questions within the chat. So I'm gonna ask a couple of those first, then a couple of mine, then, then the big picture one. Um, so first off, um, Community, so Sound Transit contracts with Community Transit to operate buses into in Snohomish County uh, for like the 512 bus, for example. How does the new fare enforcement policy um, relate to uh, enforcement on buses and also the relationship with the agencies themselves? Uh, does your fare enforcement affect how Community Transit would be enforcing the, the fares on Sound Transit buses? 
No, the policy is specific to the open portions of our system. So it would apply to Link, Sounder, and eventually BRT. Uh, because of the interaction with the operator, uh, the, the, the compliance is, is very different because the operator has you know, that discretionary moment uh, when someone boards and pays their fare. Um, and then Hester had a great question for Justin. Uh, which I think is fairly straightforward, and I think I know the answer, but um, if not all of the transit agencies participate uh, in this opportunity, does the funding get redistributed to the other agencies? Yeah, so um, I'm a pie guy, I like pie, and uh, I'm okay if somebody else doesn't eat pie because it leaves more pie for me, so that's kind of the analogy I'm going to give you, yeah. It, in, in our mind, it goes back into the pot and distributed. So Washout is already saying that they would have a deadline of October 1st or October 15th-ish for everybody to get their policies in and make sure that they're doing it. And then they have the opportunity to run the calculation of who's in. Um, and so they wouldn't run that calcul they wouldn't run that calculation after afterwards. So for example, say Ben Franklin Transit, who's literally putting up a a resolution at their board meeting in a few weeks to reduce their sales tax collection um, voluntarily, they wouldn't be eligible. So $3.4 million would go back into the pot and be a part and distributed up for everybody else. Um, and Russ, maybe there's a question for you, but um, the we do have a new ORCA coming down the line, and so there's a lot of conversations that are happening between the agencies around how the fares are being worked on. Um, how does the work that you're doing fit into those coordination efforts with the other agencies? I mean, it's a good question. You know, I think we're right at the point where we're trying to figure out, uh, you know, what to take back to our board for impact. We are trying to coordinate. Um, you know, with other agencies, there's currently a subcommittee that's been pulled together to work on fairs, and I'm sure that they will be working on uh, youth fairs. And there's a committee, I believe, with WISTA um, that Sound Transit will be part of to talk through kind of how all this is going to work. So, you know, the, the, it's just a challenge with ORCA Next Gen because right now it's in a in a freeze moment. So you can't make any changes to the software right now as they roll it out. And until it gets fully rolled out, there isn't the ability to make a change. So, uh, you know, if you've got to go in and code that all youth is zero fair, um, that may lag a little bit. So I think uh, uh, Justin's uh, talked about this. Um, you know, I think there's one thing to approve the policy and indicate that's the direction you want to go. There's another thing to implementation. And the implementation, I think, is maybe more uh, what everyone's trying to figure out right now than do, are they supportive of zero fare uh, for, for uh, 18, 364 days and under? There's a couple of um, questions I got from Amy Biggs in the chat and that I, I have, uh, which relate to what if we went to zero fare for everyone and what would that mean for us? Um, and for, I, I'm curious as a, for transit agencies, you know, that would, uh, fares are a certain percentage of everybody's revenue to some extent. So King County Metro would be impacted pretty significantly because fares is a huge portion of their overall revenue picture. And then smaller agencies like Island Transit, it's literally 0% of their, um, their funding picture. Um, and then there are others, there's federal requirements of, of having fares if you're receiving federal grants. Um, and then often fares are used as match dollars, uh, whether you're nonprofit or transit agencies in order to get grant state and federal grants. So maybe uh, any one of you uh, panelists, um, could you address kind of what, what the potential downsides are to going towards zero fare or upsides, I guess, to, to that extent, but. I mean, I have an opinion, which is one, it's a local decision. And two, um, I'm a, I make good money. I don't need free fare. I can pay my fare, but there are people out there that, that shouldn't uh, have to pay. 
I did this calculation one time. I was quick, quickly looking in my email for Senator Hobbs at one time and said, what if we just paid all the fares in the entire state? And it was like several hundred million dollars a year um, that it would it would be to do that. And so um, that's just sort of like, I'll leave it at that. If I find it before we end, I'll, I'll put it in the. Yeah, I'll just point out that in one minute, I'm probably not going to get through all the nuances of it, but um, I put in the chat a link to a transit talk that we had that explored, you know, all the impacts and possible benefits of uh, free transit. So if folks have additional time, I recommend watching that. Okay, I'll end on, on maybe one last question, which is, Hester, you posed an intriguing question for transit agencies as they're thinking about it, about who benefits um, of the fair structures, the fair enforcement uh, mechanisms. And I'm, I'd am i like to pose that question back to the panelists of like, what are your thoughts in terms of who benefits? Um, how do you address that question? Um, what does it mean to you um, in terms of coming up with a, the, the right fair structure and enforcement structures? So I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's a balancing act and that may sound a bit of a cop out response, but it, it's an honest response um, because uh, at other transit agencies that I've worked at when uh, fair revenue goes down, they have to make significantly tough choices about what, what to do with service because it does impact service. As I mentioned that um, currently just with a 40% non-compliance, it looks like the impact could be, you know, about six billion dollars on us. Um, now that would could impact the speed at which we deliver on the capital program. It could affect, you know, six minute headways going to ten minute headways, fifteen minute headways. So I think it's always about a balance. And for us, you know, it's about putting the passenger and what the passenger experiences at the forefront, and really leaning into we want everybody to be able to utilize our system to get where they need to go to connect more people to more places. But how do we balance that so we're not um, relying too much on uh, Fairbox recovery to do that? And we're making sure that those that need the most support get it so they can continue to use our system. Um, so it's a it's a challenging question. Uh, it does have ramifications one way or the other, um, but it's something that we do think about. I think I'll leave it there just because we're out of time. Uh, this has been a great, engaging, and informative discussion. I want to thank uh, Justin, Hester, and Russ for, for being here and providing uh, such great presentations. Um, we look forward to, I don't yet have the next um, snow track uh, presentation day set up, uh, but look forward to getting that out. If you'd like to stay in touch, uh, subscribe to our newsletter, and you'll get all the information about the next upcoming events. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.